G'day expats, welcome to another episode of Expat Chat, episode 115, and today I'm joined with my co-host, friend, mate, mentor, business partner, Brett Evans, who is the founding director of the Atlas Wealth Group, as well as the managing director of the Europe, Middle East and Africa's region, and recently I've been deemed to call him the Oracle of the Middle East as well. G'day Brett, how are you? Good, thanks mate, I've been called worse things, so I'll take that, I'll take whatever I can get these days, so... <laughs> <laughs> not on a daily basis, but I get called many things. But uh, folks, <laughs> thanks for joining us and uh, joined by the uh, Siamese twin to my right, your left, however you're looking at it, Mr. James Ridley is the Managing Director for the Australian Office and uh, Specialist on the Asia and the Americas market. G'day, mate. G'day, mate. And uh, Brett, today we are going to dive into, unpack a little bit the recent Australian federal budget and uh, what budget? What was in there? <laughs> what was in there? <laughs> what wasn't in there? <laughs> um, yeah. But uh, I mean, we'll, we'll jump in that today. But before we jump into it, mate, I'll let you uh, get the jingle, get the disclaimer out of the way. Yep. All the information out to here. Don't trust us. Don't listen to us. Listen to Albo. He's smarter. Um, yeah. No. In all seriousness. All the information about the talk to you is informational, educational purposes only. Please do not construe this as personal advice. If you do need personal advice, hit us up at atlaswealth.com. That's it, mate. And the budget, I mean, the Australian federal budget, we, uh, I think Australian expats and uh, I guess expats in general, um, we were looking forward to the budget, hoping there was going to be some important news in there and ideally some other things, tax changes, capital gains tax changes, um, super concessions, um, but it was pretty light on um, in a lot of different categories, wasn't it? Mate, I think old Jimmy Boy, Jim Chalmers, I think he's made a rod for his own back because essentially what he's mm. done is it is inflationary, it is stimulatory, which we'll go through in a yep. second, why? Mm -hmm. But if you think about it, he's trying to deal with the big issue, which is the cost of living, and he wants to go into the election, which this is an yep. election budget. You yep. know, addressing cost of living crisis, but he hasn't done that. All he's done is kick the can in the road. You know, the three hundred dollar rebate on electricity—it's not in perpetuity. It's got to stop. So then the electricity prices yep. go back up again. So he is hoping and praying that a he'll get re-elected. I think it's going to be an early election before Christmas. I think it'll be October. Mm. But b by the time he's in, and the feet are back under the desk, that the RBA have inflation under control which yep. I don't think they will because looking at the numbers that come out from the budget, they're very different to the set of numbers that the RBA released. And even the RBA's numbers are wrong as well too. So if you look at the most conservative opinion, that's Treasury, that's what the budget's built on, that's what Jim presented this week, and it's light years different to what the RBA is expecting mm. in terms of inflation, in terms of GDP growth and all these things. And um, it's going to be a case of who's right. And I don't think Jimmy Boy is going to be right. No, no, I agree with you. Um, it was just it's really, really disappointing, to be honest, the budget. I mean, it, it was very light on. I, I think you're right, right in terms of it was a very neutral and safe and conservative. And they harped on about the surplus again. Um, and, you know, look at how good we're doing. Um, their figures on growth expectations and inflation there's a divide there or a delta from the RBA. So you kind of just go, why? <laughs> what, yeah. what do you know that they don't know? Or what do they know that you don't know? <laughs> so, well, the um, other thing too is it's not been from their good stewardship. You know, the reason why we've had budget surpluses and surprising even Treasury themselves on the upside is because of high royalties from commodity prices and high tax yep. receipts with unemployment yep. or employment, I should say. So yep. they can try and claim that they've stimulated the economy by creating full employment. Uh, I wouldn't give them that much credit, but no. it's been not through good policy that they're in that budget surplus right now. And um, an interesting fact, which I'll, I'll, I'll raise with the, the folks on the call today, which I loved, I saw this and I thought we're really going to hone into this one. So six months ago, Treasury estimated that their total federal spending for 2024-25 at $710 billion. But this week it got revised up to $727 billion. So $12 billion of the $17 billion that's just been added was spent just this week. So if you want to put it another way, the budget deficit they're forecasting for next year is 283 
And if they didn't spend all that money this week, it'd only be 8.9. So they get to get pretty close to doing a surplus next year. But getting mm. a surplus next year doesn't get them re-elected before the budget next year. No. No, not at all. It's, so they'd, uh, rather, they'd, rather yeah. feel, but they'd rather talk their own side up to get re-elected as opposed to looking after the greater the economy by trying to keep it into a neutral or, or, or surplus position. Yeah, that's right. I, 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 it's, I don't know if they'll hold office, to be honest, because uh, they've, they've been rather probably lucky the, the way things have uh, gone the last two years in terms of they haven't had to do too much um, to really give us. The, would you say the budget was a little bit um, into, like stimulating or adding to inflation a little bit over the next four to 18 months? Yep. Yeah, 100%. And, and the way these things work is it, it's not stimulatory today or tomorrow. It's a 12-month process. So mm. what it's meant is they've kicked the can down the road that there will be an inflation problem in 12 months' time. But they don't care because they're hoping to be re-elected by the time and they'll deal with that problem then. As yep. opposed to yep. regardless of our own personal view, we don't want the economy to have this sticky inflation or the potential of stagflation issues. So mm -hmm. therefore we're not going to spend too much of this budget. Yeah. Yeah. So, that's right. And, and, and the world is dealing with this sticky inflation issue. You know, us um, especially. So I don't know. I mean, to me, it's a very, it's a budget election. It's just that, you know, uh, very broad headlines. It's those sound bites that politicians love to give the journos. Yeah, everyone gets a tax deduction, a uh, tax, you know, um, tax reduction. Yeah, you know, whether you're earning five hundred thousand or fifty thousand, everyone's everyone's a winner. It's like it's like going on an Oprah show. Yeah. <laughs> everyone's a winner. So it's silly that I mean, we already knew about that though. I mean, that was already you know that was already baked in. They had the 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 stage three tax cuts, then they got revised, and then they got leg legislated. And the fact that they even taught, um, talked about it, it's like, why are you talking about this? We already know this. We knew this six months ago when you revised it. Um, and we already know, why is this even part of the budget? Like, that's a known known already. Tell me about the known unknowns Unknown. and the unknown unknowns that you haven't even yeah. told us about. But yeah. they were light on that. Yeah. It's, it's funny how, you know, uh, we presented the Dubai edition of the seminar for the budget. Uh, last night, and a topic of hot debate was the hex and help debt resetting of how they get to index yeah. help debt, and they're going to backdate it to to last year. Yep. And as I said to the audience, but they haven't told us how to get a refund if your hex debt was indexed up by seven point one. Yep. And you paid it off. That's right. Yeah. There's no way. They've, so they're saying, oh, we got to reset it back and everyone's fine. Okay, well, what about those folks who paid it off in the last 12 months after it indexed mm. up? How do they get their money back? So, well, yeah, once I mean, again, good headlines. I mean, we, can but... <laughs> we can make a guess. I think uh, I think it'll go on everyone's integrated client account, but how do they, how do they, re how do they actually yeah. uh, withdraw it? Because, I mean, they would uh, – and, I mean, I wonder if that impacts um, – and these are the things I'm think you, you think about. It. Everyone's gonna, everyone that had a hex last year that is going to get that credit. And you know, I think they've probably created a calculator where you can work out your credit. Um, if you've got no reason to lodge a tax return because you're a non-resident and you've got say no assets back in Australia, you've declared yourself a non-resident, but you've had to do the hex lodgements. Yes, uh, do they log into their MyGov and then they see a credit there and go, oh, cool, I'll refund that. But how do I put that into a bank account? I, yeah, the mechanics yeah. of that doesn't doesn't really stack up. Um, no. But it also, uh, it's yeah, it's just funny that uh, how it's all going to operate. The fact that they are changing it to be either CPI or wage price wage index. index. Um, yeah. That's right. Yeah. So <laughs> I guess they're they're putting a few people probably at a disadvantage by making that update. At least they're going back one year, but what about the year before that? <laughs> so on and exactly. so forth. Yeah, 100%. And it's, I think it's one of those situations where you just go, once again, they're trying to grab headlines, mm. but the big thing's going to be, and I think it's it's either going to make them or break them as interest rates. You yeah. don't want to go into an election with rates rising on your watch. It no. Really has, no. And they've been grappling with it. And like I said last night to the folks in Dubai and to the folks in, in Abu Dhabi tonight, um, you know, I'll run through this with everyone in person. If you couldn't make it, you know, you missed a good one uh, because obviously this goes out after we've uh, we've done that presentation. We've done them. <laughs> um, but, you know, it's interesting how at an election, 
can swing on so many ways. And right now it's about 50-50 mm. whether it's Labor or Lib. Yeah. On your, if you're the incumbent government going in and rates are rising in your watch, you have to really push hard to try and control the narrative. Um, and what's interesting is uh, we, I was doing some research for the, for the seminar and um, when you looked at the trim mean inflation on a quarterly basis, every time for the history of the RBA, it's either 0.9 or above, the RBA has always raised rates. Mm. This month when it came out, it was at 1%, and the RBA yep. didn't raise rates. So is there a bit of political influence there? You know, where there's been a lot of conversation right now about central banks losing their autonomy. You know, that's the conversation's yeah. happening happening in um, the US as well too. You know, did Jim call Michelle and say, hey, I'm about to release the budget. You know, don't um, crap in my backyard while I'm trying to do this. God. So the big question is going to be, and, and the proof will be in the pudding, is when the quarter two number gets released at the end of July, if that's 0.9 or above and they don't raise rates, then we've got a big problem with the RBA. Yeah, well, it's obviously copying too much influence and um... – that is, you're right. That is a big concern because there is meant to still be a secondary um, panel or committee to essentially review the decisions of the RBA. That hasn't been actually created yet. That's something that's still in the works. So, yeah. <laughs> so but the, I mean, we know RBA needs to be independent of the actual government. Um, yeah. Going to run into a real risk there if there is political influence there. That's I honestly think that's why also um, Philip Lowe. I mean, he was some for, somewhat crucified and used as a huge scapegoat for the Australian government when he left office and was the left governor, to be honest. It really felt for him. He had a hard job. He was relying on the data. The data just wasn't good. It wasn't quick either. It took yep. too long to rely Quarterly on. Quarterly so monthly. And, yeah. That's right. C couldn't make those informed decisions quick enough. Um, so we're just sort of playing catch-up still, unfortunately. So I reckon you're right. When we looked at the uh, data uh, a little about a week or two ago from the RBA that put out and um, we saw those inflation figures leading up to the recent RBA decision, there was actually a 40% probability based on the rate tracker on the um, ASX, ASX. That, that it was going to go up. So 40% is actually really high. Yeah. Um, it would be very interesting to see what it looks like, say, uh, leading to the next decision, whether it's even higher than that. Because um, you're right, I think we're, we're sort of in that period where if inflation doesn't move too much this year, they obviously have the ammo to go one more. They, yep. they definitely have the ammo. And that might be that final nail in the coffin to sort of wind it back over the next, say, 18 months. And then we might not see a rate cut until maybe halfway through next year, as an example, or probably after that. My biggest concern, and I was, I was having a big whinge to Jeremy, um, uh, our uh, director for mortgage broker side, um, I was having a big whinge is that they're going to cut rates too early. I was like, we really need to be in pain. We need to be in more pain for them to actually cut interest rates. And right now, I don't think the Australian economy is. I think we actually need to, there needs to be a bit more red. I agree. I agree. And, and what's interesting, actually, the RBA, if you look at their forecasts, um, if I can just find it here. So... Um, well, you're doing that. Uh, the reason why we need to see more red uh, for our listeners is because if we don't see more red and they cut interest rates sooner and they should have held the, the cash rate where it is or gone up one more for, say, another 12 months, it will take a lot longer for the Australian economy and the RBA to get a, a grapple on inflation. Rather yep. than taking 18 months, it could take three to five years and then we're in this really shit period of stagflation and we've got really poor wage growth. We've got we've got a lot more issues, which are really really hard to actually get a to the grip, get a grip on. So yep. we need we, we need a bit more red first before they do anything. Sorry, Brett, you go, man. No, that's right. So just looking here, this is from the horse's mouth. RBA Michelle herself. She said they forecast assume cash rates remain where it is until mid twenty twenty five, and then falls to three point eight percent by mid twenty twenty six. That's as of last week. That's their words. Yep. So all those people out there who are calling for a rate cut this year, they've got no chance. Even calling for rate cuts next year, you know, it's not going to happen according to the RBA until the later half of next year. So I think what the RBA is trying to do is death by a thousand cuts to the yep. Australian consumer rather than yep. go for the pain now, push them into that pain, then pull them out. It's just like, mm. no, we're just going to stretch you along. 
this uncomfortable plane. Yep. But the problem is yep. people's finances adjust. And um, yep. when they adjust, you know, they sort of get back into that comfortable phase. Whereas, as you say, they need that knife to the ribs just to really feel uncomfortable and sort of make systematic changes. <laughs> Knife to the ribs. <laughs> what do you mean? Watching what TV show? <laughs> watching yeah, that Shogun or something? Or, yeah, Shogun <laughs> on Disney or something? Yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, hundred percent. I I couldn't agree more. Um, I mean, you know, dovetailing back into what else wasn't really in the budget. Um, we know that they announced that that change in the future for that foreign resident capital gains withholding tax. And that hits yep. a lot of Australians um, that living overseas, but they may be selling a former main residence or they're selling a, uh, a for, you know, investment property back property. in Australia. Um, we, we actually didn't see anything more on that. Um, still to be legislated, still out in the ether. What about, or what else didn't we see, Brett? Right. Um, the tax residency rule changes, the modernizing tax residency. And uh, sure. Yeah, it's, like I said to the folks last night in Dubai, the government only has so many bullets to fire in terms of a budget, when in terms of their policies and their framework. If they didn't have an election coming up, 100% mm -hmm. they would pull the, pull the trigger on this. But yep. they want to use all the noise and their hours of scope to push. You know, we're freezing pricing on pharmacy uh, prescriptions. We're doing this, we're doing this, we're doing this to set themselves up for that election. Because I think they know that this time next year, Australia, the economy is not going to be in a good position. So they want to quickly get this budget done and, and get this election out of the way before, and they're not going to string it out till May next year. Because if, you know, if, if RBA does raise rates, that's going to slow the economy down even more. And then this time next year, you're going to see an economy that's not as strong as it is at the moment, which, to be honest with you, it's not very strong. Yeah, yeah, no, I agree, hundred percent. And I, I think uh, when you when you actually had your seminar, you, you you sort of provided a bit of insight into how currency's going, markets going. Currency is always a good one because uh, I, I mean, the Australian dollar, it's I suppose I would say remained depressed, but it's because nothing really has changed. Also, <laughs> yeah. um, you've still got the central banks around the world that hasn't changed. Um, so. US dollars obviously still a little bit higher. It's got more value than ours. Um, commodity prices they hasn't haven't really helped the Australian dollar either. So, you know, I think if we looked at probably a lot of the expectations for the Australian dollar this year, probably maybe November last year, we would have thought we would have seen it higher than where it is right now. But there's been absolute no movement on cash rate, so there's no yep. reason for it to move. Plus, we've still got weakening the commodity prices. Yep, and that's the two things that are catalysts for the Australian dollar, commodity prices and interest rates. And certainly if interest rates rise in the next couple of months, we might see the dollar strengthen a bit. And look, it's at 66 now to the US, so maybe the market's starting to factor in the chance of a, a rate rise in the coming months is increasing the, mm. the dollar. But on the same side, we've got a slump in the in coke and coal price, but not a slump, but a, you know, certainly moderating of iron ore prices. And to mm. me... While China's not firing, they're the two main consumers of those raw materials that come out of Australia, iron ore and coal, coke and coal right. and thermal coal. And um, it doesn't make uh, a good story from a strong dollar position. You know, the only way I can see the dollar getting up towards, say, 68 to, to 70 cents the US dollar will be if Michelle raises rates at the RBA. Yep, yep. And then, I mean, the other thing, the other big issue, um, well, not, I mean, currency is not an issue. I won't say that. But from the budget, I thought we would have seen more to help the housing sector. Um, and it was more mainly around public housing. Um, Correct. Yeah. Nothing, nothing that incentivizes the Australian economy to build quicker. There was some verbiage around reducing approval timeframes, but I feel like that's just, it's bold it's just shit, just shit yeah. in there. That's not actually going to happen. Um, and it's just a lot of waffle. Uh, so, they're not they're not solving anything for the housing crisis in Australia. They really aren't, to be honest. No, the only real two things I saw they did was turn down migration, um, because that was obviously a catalyst for the property growth in the last twelve yep. months. Big like, yep. over half of, of what it was previously, uh, and also two, they've told universities to get a limit international student numbers um, unless the universities provide accommodation. So they're worried about yeah. foreign students coming in taking yep. accommodation of local residents. So they're yep. saying to saying to universities, you guys have to provide the accommodation because we're sick of 
building your business up, you know, in terms of foreign students and then taking out the local community, forcing local residents out. God, that's only really going to benefit a lot of those private universities, I, I think. I know... Uh, well, they they build a dorm and they'll charge a fortune. Yeah, well, that's true, actually. I mean, yeah, that's, that's very true, actually. So maybe that's uh, that's something that'll help, but nah, that's going to be a mere drop in the ocean. Mere drop in the ocean, but also, too, it's, what, it taken two years to build something? Oh, so yeah, it's, more it's, now. <laughs> yeah, so, and that's the thing. It's Once again, it grabs a great headline and it, it, it pieces and appeals to the voter. You know, those bloody foreign students, they're taking our houses. Oh, good on you, Albo, you, you've stopped that. It hasn't stopped anything. It's just made an announcement, that's all. No, if you, no, if you it's fly funny, next I... week as a foreign student, you're still living in local housing. Yeah, that's right. And it's funny. I mean, the the amount of budget webinars I've sat in in the last 48 hours, um, a lot of them are mainly talking about what's not in there because <laughs> it's a pretty light on federal budget. It is. So, it's, actually, um, it's actually hard to present because mm. I'm just looking here at my presentation. You know, my, yeah, my, yeah. my slides on the budget itself, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, eight pages. Yeah. Yeah. That's yeah. It. And then, I mean, and we don't know any more about the residency rules. We know that, again, you know, they opened up for consultation last year. They closed the consultation. They're digesting the feedback. There's been whiffs of news, but nothing, nothing of substantial or note. Um, missed it out on the budget. Does that mean they they go and they don't really talk about it again until the new financial year. And then is it too soon? If they're mentioning something and re bring out a new proposal or draft legislation, say, in the new financial year, does that mean it'll be legislated by 1st of July 2025 or will it be pushed no. back again? Like, it's just... There's only two and a half months of sitting period in the first half of every calendar year. So let's mm. say they get voted back in before Christmas. They've then yep. got to put it through the lower house and the upper house, get well sent in two and a half months, which is yep. not going to happen. So they'd use yep. up too much political capital to get that through that yep. quickly. So to me, as I said to the folks last night, I can't, if, if that's if they get re-elected, if they get re-elected, mm. I think it's now up to 1 July 2026. It'll be announced yep. in the budget next year. It'll go through parliament later half of next year, early the following year to come in on 1 July 2026. The fly in the ointment is that the Libs get in. Now, do they take up the work that Treasury's already done and say, yep, we're mm. happy with that, we'll go with it? Or do they decide to put their Recall. own spin on it? Yeah. Reset. So it could be even longer. And go back to the Board of Taxation, throw the book at them, go rewrite it, have another oh, go. Exactly. <laughs> tell, tell them they're a bunch of Muppets because they're referencing the wrong UK legislation when it comes to comparing apples <laughs> with apples. I mean, that was just embarrassing. Even I saw Have it. another go. UK. Oh, it was just like we're benchmarking ourselves against the UK. Yeah, but you're not benchmarking on the right piece of legislation. Anyway, I yeah, can it does way. need it. But I mean, I mean, for our listeners, our residency rules, they do need to be updated. They're too old. There's too mm. much grey area. It's, there's too much probably, uh, too much, uh, I think, favour given to the ATO and what they can nitpick at. So we do need updated rules. In their current form, they're shit. Um, they need to go back and rewrite them. Um, but... The, the rules that they have put forward, they do provide clarity, and that's really important. You know, we don't it's, want any grey areas. It's a scoring system, ones and zeros. Yep. There's no debate. There's yep. no grey, as you say. Yep. And and what what we need for people to make concise decisions, they need to have concise information. And, mm. you know, like I've always said to clients, the current rules are so bad that they need to go to court for a judge to work out who's right and who's wrong. How can... Yeah. Mr. and Mrs. Smith, who are about to become expats, apply the current framework when the ATO has to go to the High Court to to justify their their answers. So yeah, well, think about all the uh, the the money that's been spent by the Commissioner of Taxation through legal fees to run through residency rulings. When if they just had clear and defined residency legislation probably would have saved hundreds of million dollars over the last 20 or 30 years. <laughs> Easy. Um, Easy. Yeah. yeah Maybe that's the, Harding the, case. Uh, the Harding case apparently cost like yeah. 15 mil alone. Taxpayers' money. It's good. Yep. <laughs> yep. No, exactly. So, but yeah, so <laughs> for the folks out there. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah no, that's right, mate. Yep. No, I was just saying for the folks out there, you know, um, essentially it was a non-event. Um, get mm. ready to go to the elections if you are 
on the literal realm. Um, but to me, yeah, it, it's very disappointing in terms of, um, yeah, you want to see a bit of stewardship, a bit of a governor, governorship in terms of the economy. And it was just, it was woeful. It was really quite embarrassing. It's sort of like, uh, you know, they're, they're cutting and pasting letters from newspapers, you know, to, to make it look like a nice big headline, but national fact it. Yeah, there's not much there. So, but for the folks on the call, um, I'll include a link below to our webinar that we're we're doing on this. So, just because you're not in Dubai and Abu Dhabi doesn't mean you miss out. Um, we've got clients in 48 other countries or more. Um, <laughs> so, we'll be running uh, dual webinars uh, in the coming weeks. We'll put a link down below for everyone to register. And uh, James, as always, mate, thanks very much for your expert analysis. I think you need to fly down to Canberra and smack them over the chops and give them an uppercut and tell them to wake up themselves. <laughs> Some good wineries down in Canberra. Maybe I do. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It's coming up to ski season too. That's it. <laughs> so, don't break a leg. <laughs> uh, thanks for our listeners and uh, see you guys on the next episode. Thanks, Brett. Cheers. Thanks, mate.